So Dylan Russell pitches for £330,000 to fund a commercial to residential conversion project. As you know, that's right up my street. So does he get it? Well, you're going to have to stay tuned to find out. Now, what you're about to see is a clip from Property Elevator Show, which normally airs on Sky Channel 192. It's a pitching show where budding property entrepreneurs uh, come on uh, TV to pitch for funding for their property projects, and they pitch for funding to five property angels. The property angels that feature on the show are John Howard, Helen Chorley, Paul Mahoney, Nicholas Woolwork, and myself, Ranjan Bhattacharya. So you're about to see what was broadcast on Sky 192, uh, complete with me kind of giving you reaction and a little bit of analysis and my commentary on what happened. So without further ado, let me hand you over to the show's presenter, Elizabeth Warburton, who has a chat to our budding entrepreneur, Dylan Russell. Welcome to the show. Hi, Lizzie. Thanks for having me. How are you doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. Feeling excited? Yeah, excited and a bit nervous. Good. Don't be nervous. Mm. It's fine. Okay. They're all really lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tell yeah. us a little bit about the deal. It's a commercial property con that I'm going to be converting into residential. Great. Yeah. And how much investment are you looking for today? I'm lo hoping for 330000 In exchange of? Uh, so 40% equity. Okay, great. Yeah. Very, so. nice. Very nice. We're now off to Milton Keynes and Dylan is bringing this deal to us. I think it's a nurse, uh, nursery at the moment and he's looking to convert it potentially into yet another HMO or I think uh, splitting into houses which would be quite interesting. Let's get him in. Dylan, thank you very much for coming in today. So tell us a bit about yourself and your, and your background and then um, about the deal you wish us to fund, please. My background is I arrived five years ago in the country from South Africa, as I'm sure you can tell, uh, not Australian. But uh, so I arrived with £550 in my pocket and uh, got on a train. I'd been an economics teacher in South Africa and I uh, arrived here and didn't have any jobs or, you know, accommodation sorted and went around trying to find a room to live in. And no one wanted to rent to me because I just arrived in the country, didn't have credit history, didn't have any wages. But I managed to find a room eventually by walking into an estate agency after the second day thinking I'd end up on the street and there's a South African there. And I said to him, can I rent a room? He gave me a room. I said, how did you do what you did with property? And he told me, and I said to him, I'll work a day a week for free. What I want to know is what you know, I don't need money from you. And so he allowed me to do that. And it turned out he ran the Northampton property meet. He told me to do 20,000 leaflets. And I did 22,000 leaflets and I got a lease option deal. And that was my first deal about three years ago. And from there, I've worked on you know, uh, joint ventures, raising private finance. I've managed to build it up to a 2.4 million pound portfolio. With now, what an inspirational story that is of Dylan. I have to declare an interest here. I actually know the, uh, the person he's talking about who runs that uh, estate agency and um, took him in, took him under his wing, you know, but uh, I think there are two things that came out of that. Firstly, it's his sheer determination to make something happen and to learn. And the other thing is the, um, the key thing about finding someone uh, to act as a mentor, as a guide, someone who's been there and trod the path, uh, who can help him kind of accelerate his own journey and uh, sort of uh, avoid some of the uh, blind alleys that you can get get into if you just do property all on your own. So what he did is very much uh, textbook stuff in terms of uh, getting started. Full credit to Dylan. With this property deal, it's a property in Milton Keynes where I'm currently living and I've managed to, so it's on for 500,000 we can secure it for. The cash that's needed is 250,000 pounds. The plan is to convert it into a 10-bed HMO. Uh, the cash flow of that uh, should be about £3,000 net profit per month. There's planning uh, permission that's lapsed. So the plan is to try and get planning for it. And there are three options in the second stage. So the first stage will be refinancing at six months as a 10-bed HMO. And that will leave £180,000 in the deal. Within 18 months, apply for the planning permission from day one and build either an extension, so get six bedrooms more, which will push cash flow up to 4,700 per month, or else uh, to build a house and sell that 
and, and that would get, you know, release all the initial cash, flow, cash back to you as an investor. So you have no money left in the deal. Cash flow would be a bit less, obviously, that compared to holding it, but you would have all your cash out. Okay, let's try to unpick um, some of what's going on here. So the property that we're looking at is a commercial property. Although it doesn't look like a commercial property, it looks like a regular house because that's probably what it was originally built for. But what it's actually used for is a nursery. Um, that's, that's its uh, current usage. So all commercial properties um, uh, are classified according to a usage class. And the usage class for, for nurseries was D1. I say was because after this was actually shot, this episode was shot uh, during the summer of 2020. And as of 1st of September uh, 2020, um, the usage class system changed. Uh, the government brought in a new usage class called E, which basically encompasses things like nurseries and um, normal shops, banks, estate agencies. It, it, it encompasses a whole bunch of um, usages under one usage class E. So when you hear people talk about D1 usage class, that really relates to before uh, the 1st of September 2020. Uh, so that's what they're talking about here. Now, the other thing Dylan said is that the building had planning permission, which has lapsed. Now, when you apply for planning permission to do something, uh, that planning permission stays on the books for three years. Now, if you do not implement that planning permission in that three year period, then it lapses. And if you want to do that planning um, scheme, you have to reapply. So the planning permission that had lapsed was to basically convert this uh, D1 former nursery building into a into a dwelling house, into a single family home. So that planning permission was given, but it had lapsed. Now, my thought here is why? Why has it lapsed? Um, it's often lapsed because someone got the planning permission and then crunched all their figures and actually realized, well, actually, this ain't worthwhile doing. Uh, and when you look at a planning application that's lapsed, that is the question that you need to answer and you need to eliminate uh, before proceeding further. Um, and the third option would be to convert into four flats um, and that would actually release an extra £70,000 on top of your money coming out. So we'd have £70,000 and I'd propose that we reinvest that and you know, source another deal and refinance that money into a new deal. So, so Dylan is looking at a number of different alternative ideas, which is good. It's always good when you're looking at any, any, any property deal to have multiple exit routes to uh, basically um, hedge your bets. So he's, he's, he's on, on one angle, he's looking at converting it into several different flats. That's after building an extension at the back. He's looking at converting the whole lot into an HMO building. Uh, so he's got multiple different ideas of what he can do. Uh, let's see what happens. So first of all, your story is incredibly humbling uh, and uh, well done you, fantastic. Ditto what John said there, really incredible story, well done. And it just shows that if you apply yourself, you know, Success can be taught. You can learn from other people. Having good mentors is important and, and doing hard work to understand how to do these things yeah. mm. is critical. I'd say one of my main expertise is, is commercial to residential conversions and specifically micro studios and H. Yeah, me too. Jamosa, He's this not is, the only one, but this the is a nice. Okay. Uh, yeah. Everyone's uh, putting in their credibility statement here, aren't they? A nice <laughs> unit, I like it. You know, I'm interested. Uh, really on your market valuation initially, your stage one refinancing. Yeah. Um, what is that a refinance of? Stage one would be refinancing as, so again, a commercial valuation so as okay. a 10-bed HMO. And what is it now? Currently, it's been used as a doctor's surgery. Doctor's, so it's D, yeah. D1? Yeah, but it was residential before got converted into a doctor's surgery. Sorry, may, uh, mistaken before. It's a uh, doctor's surgery. I said, no, I said uh, kids nursery, uh, but it's still the same usage class um, D1 that we're talking about. But I don't know if you can see the picture on the screen uh, when they showed the, the building. It, it was actually built as a detached house and then later on became a doctor's surgery. And this is quite common up and down the country. Surgery, and now we're going back. Okay, and the lapsed planning is for a single C3 house? That's correct, yeah. So. As you can see on that picture, it, the planning was for it to come out. I mean, the, the options we have is to go the other way. So the planning was for physical building works and conversion to a large C3 single dwelling house? Yes, that's correct. Okay, so and you would like to put in, to get this 600,000 valuation, 
you need to get planning for that again or something similar exactly. to the side. Yeah. What, what's next door? Now, this is the thing here. Um, the, the, the planning permission is uncertain. So uh, he's looking at a £600,000 valuation, which may or may not happen, but that is dependent on getting planning permission. So he's looking for an investment today based on something that is uncertain because the planning permission is by no means in the bag. Next door, either side. Uh, so next door is just a parking lot, and then okay. next door to the right is uh, another house. So that's all residential all the way up. This is it like a residential area. It looks that's quite correct. leafy, quite nice area. Yeah, nice expensive houses. Yeah, you might get you know a bit of pushback from the council on a on a ten bed HMO. Mm. Um, there's probably a better way of doing that. Now, what Nicholas was trying to ask, he wasn't being nosy there about who the neighbours are. He's asking for actually quite real reasons. Um, if you live in a residential area which is full of owner occupiers, particularly as um, the uh, the owner occupiers, if they're living in detached properties, like it looks as though this neighbourhood is, then they tend to get more and more protective about a property becoming an HMO. And he's talking about a proposal to, to make this quite a large number of rooms, which will obviously have an impact on the neighbours and they're likely to complain, to put it bluntly. Um, which would you know, be maybe two flats and then use C3 to C4 permitted <coughs> development rights to, to get two six bed HMOs. Mm. So what Nicholas is suggesting as a workaround, which is actually perfectly valid in most areas, but we'll soon to find out it doesn't quite work in Milton Keynes, but in most areas, instead of just going for a super big um, HMO of say 10 rooms or something like that, it's far better or easier or more straightforward to make two flats um, and make each one of those flats into smaller HMOs, which are under the licensing threshold. Because mm -hmm. you'd get the first phase of planning through quite easily as two flats, the council yeah. tick a few boxes. I'm open to that. It's because the main thing you have in Milton Keynes and the issue you run into in planning uh, with HMOs is parking. With this property, as you can see, there's parking all the way got lots of parking. around, yeah, yeah. which is the advantage. You, if the neighbours complain profusely, that that's where your issue might lie Absolutely. politically. Mm. Um, that, you know, is there an Article Four direction area in Milton Keynes or yeah. specifically this area? Uh, there's an Article 4 across the whole of Milton Keynes. So this is in an Article 4 direction. That's correct, yeah. So uh, what we're talking about here, I mean, essentially what uh, Nicholas is saying is, as I said, in, in residential areas, owner-occupiers, they don't tend to like HMOs next door. You tend to get least resistance from neighbours in, in actually semi-commercial buildings or mixed-use shops and uppers. I never had the neighbours complain about doing any... Um, planning application for HMO type use. What's surfacing here is the dreaded Article 4. What Article An Article 4 exists in Milton Keynes and what they're talking about is that this means that normally nationally if you have a HMO and you have more than six people in it then you need to apply for planning permission as an HMO. But where some, some councils have implemented Article 4 which means they have Tried, they've, they've imposed tougher rules in their local borough than exist nationally. So Article 4 in the HMO context means that basically if you have uh, two or more unrelated people in a property, then you still need a, an HMO license application. Um, so that causes further um, issues, if you like. Right, so, so you can't do the C3 to C4 then, obviously. No. So you would need planning. So this yeah, is very good. much... Uh, an opportunity if you can get planning. What's your target market for the HMO? So young professionals, uh, I mean there's massive demand in Milton Keynes. And you have, part of your portfolio is HMO already? Uh, that's correct. What, how many previously, what number would this be? Fifth HMO. I'm not that interested in HMOs to be fair, but there might be other angles here, like you said, and I like the fact you brought three different angles to it. If we were just to refurbish the existing building and sell it, what could we sell that for? Probably go for about 550. So I'll cross that one off. Um, and what, if we did four flats, does that include an extension or is that just the existing footprint? So in Milton Keynes, quite a few people have done them where you do it, it's almost like a cluster home. Yeah. So you have, the, you know, the, the four yep. flats, you title split it. Yeah. And um, if you were to just use the extension part to do that, the flats go for about 180, yep. you know, for a bit. 
conservatively if we saw a drop or a correction in market, yeah, if we've budgeted 150, yeah, um, yeah 600. The, in, the gross would be 600K. Uh, that's for the flat, so with the extension, so building on four flats. So you've got yeah. four flats on the extension plus the existing house? Plus the existing house, okay. yeah. So but I think one thing that hasn't been looked at here is the actual viability of getting this past planning. I mean, of course, you know, um, you could in theory, you know, build something like the Shard anywhere you like. But the feasibility of getting that through the planning department is a whole different ball game. Um, now, this looks like a street of established detached type houses. Um, so the feasibility or the probability of building an extension to this building and then getting um, sort of four flats is, uh, well, may not be possible. It's, a, it's one of those things which um, it's very, very early stage. So if we put, the, and what could we put the existing house into if it wasn't an HMO? Could we put it into another, another two big, two decent sized flats or? Yeah, or a semi. Semi, I like that. And they've got enough garden for semis either side. So we could get six units out of it, of which two semis and four. So the gross would be, so the semis what, 250 each, something like that? Uh, at least, uh, you'll get about 300,000. Well, they're very close to get, you know, they're gonna be close to all the, average. let's say, two, let's say 250 each just for the sake. So it's fine. Now, without looking too deep into the figures here, one thing I will say about this sort of scheme is that it's very rarely, unless you've got some, you know, building of um, architectural beauty or something like that, it's very rarely actually worthwhile splitting a detached house vertically into two um, semis. It is better to, since you've got to apply for planning permission anyway, apply for planning permission to knock the whole thing down and properly build on the plot um, two new build semis. Far more energy efficient and all the rest of it and far more space efficient and you'll get more, you'll get that new build premium as well. Just for the sake, so it's 500 plus 600 is 1.1, yeah? I'm not really keen on the HMO angle. That makes a lot of us, isn't it? Not keen on HMOs. Um, it's really the alternative uses that it can be put to. So you've got a D1 use here. Um, and you, you've talked about planning. So there's likely to be some very attractive alternatives for converting this to residential without the need for planning permission. It's just that we don't know about those yet. They'll be unfolding by the time this gets on air. Well, that actually hasn't happened, believe it or not. Um, what we are talking, what I'm talking about there is that uh, obviously this building has become Class E. Now, the uh, specific permitted development rights to allow converting all Class E properties into residential use have not been announced yet. We do expect those to be announced at least before 31st of July. Uh, 2021, but they haven't been announced to date. So basically what I'm speculating here is that um, it is going to be possible to do something with this site under permitted development, but right now um, those rules haven't been announced yet. If it was two semis, what would those semis go for? Conservatively 250. The, the problem with this, I think the purchase price is probably a little bit too high. Um, the reason is that the p permitted development is going to allow you to do a lot with this uh, within the existing envelope. If it was two straight floors and a loft, then you could do have a lot of fun. So, and this is the problem I find with many of these sites. You get these D1 sites, and it, it, you'd get two floors and a roof for 500 grand, and then you get basically one floor with the next floor in the roof, and they still want 500 grand for it. It's almost too but nice for it, isn't what it? What you can do with it. Yeah, what I'm trying to get at here is really how a lot of properties price, and I see this time and time again. You can see in this picture, um, the, the, the first floor is pretty much in the roof space, and this doesn't really work for carving it up. Um, and in these sort of scenarios, it's far better to knock the thing down and build what you want. But where you have two proper floors and a loft, um, you can obviously uh, get a free floor in that loft space, which is very, very valuable. With it, it's so limited. I think this is too much money as the purchase price for this type of deal. That's the problem. So if there's any downward scope on that, it, you may be able to make it into a deal, but I think it's just too much. 
I think uh, that was borne out by something that Dylan said early on as well in that the property had been on the market for a long time. I mean, the big clues with this property has been on the market forever, quite frankly. Um, it had planning permission to convert this building into one single family house. And why wasn't that done by anyone? Why wasn't it picked up by anyone to do that? Because the cost of buying it and the cost of doing the conversion just didn't make sense. Yeah, I suppose just echoing what some of the guys have already said. The 500, has that been agreed? You said it was turned down at 550. Has he agreed 500? Yeah. Does, does there seem to be flexibility on that? Potentially, if we could, you know, go through a bit quicker. But obviously, from our point of view, we wouldn't want to, you know, like, as Ranjan said. Um, yeah, I think I agree with what Ranjan said so far as the margin just being a little bit tight. If you were buying this, if you were to turn it into two semis, it would be just the two semis. Is there another, prop the existing property on top of that? Well, well, that's the option we have to build. Build the, another four build flats. another property. Right. Yeah. Okay. And what would you have preferred? So you've given kind of various options. What would your preferred option be? Doing the ten bed HMO and then having the four flats, um, refine because then you've got a bit of diversification as well. So if the HMO market turns, um, or you know the flat flats, I think is where the future is going. And yet there is such a high demand for young professionals in HMOs. So from a cash flow point of view. Uh, it works out quite well, and the refinancing point of view. And have you done an HMO in it, clearly a very residential area? Predominantly, that's where all my HMOs are. It's tantalisingly close to a deal. The problem is I don't think it's quite there. What is the potential of getting planning permission for the extra four flats? I haven't spoken to the planners, but I know, you know, from the people I've spoken to who yep. have done, gone through the process, because of the advantage of where we're building, that we're not overlooking anywhere, the thing that we'd have to see is if we built to the, that, the left hand side, that would mean that we're overlooking a parking lot. So it's, you know, from that point of view, I'm pretty confident that okay. we can. Okay, well, the good thing is you've got the parking, because mm. you're going to need one for one, or one and a half for one, or two for whatever it might be. So as long as you've got enough parking spaces there. I mean, I, I actually think it's a shame because it's almost too nice as it is, mm. and that's why it's still 500 grand. Mm. If it looked a dog, uh, it might be 400 and actually at 400 mm. um, because whatever condition it is in a way you're gonna have to do it all again anyway to a point so actually you know you're not you're, you're not really benefiting from the fact that it's it's nice and other people might buy it to make it back into a home for me it's not quite good enough it's not that far away uh, as long as you know you're gonna get the, the, the four flats but I'm afraid uh, as a deal I wouldn't want to do the HMO particularly and as a deal, I'd much rather do the four flats than the two houses. And for me, it's n the, it, you, it's, the price is just a bit too much. So it isn't something I could invest in today. I mean, you tend to find this, a lot of people that have um, um, kind of um, cut their teeth in property and have grown up and have gone on to do uh, um, uh, bigger and better things, um, tend not to like to get into the hassle, if you like, of large scale HMO development. And I think Dylan, uh, and will, this will unfold in a moment, has, has reached a stage in his career that he's ready to branch out from HMOs, which he did to get going, build a bit of cash flow, that was all well and good. But he's now ready to step up to the next level, but he feels he has a comfort zone in HMOs. Why? And I feel that's why he's kind of um, stuck on this particular strategy. Uh, John makes some excellent points there about the property. It doesn't look a total dog. Um, the best properties that I find are ones that do look like a dog um, and, 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 and smell like cat's piss, quite frankly. That's a combination of property that you want to buy because those are easy to fix and stuff that you can derive best value from. The trouble with this one, it looks more or less like a house as it is. Now, I banged on there and several of the others have picked up on this about the price you pay for the property being too high. Now, uh, people don't know this, but when people come to pitch on this show, uh, not all of it gets shown on the telly. Um, these pitches last a good hour and we ask a whole bunch of questions and a whole bunch of stuff gets cut out in the, in the edit, if you like. Now, one of the comments I made that's got cut out in the edit, and I think it's got cut out in the edit because uh, for a TV show, it might have been seen as a bit overcomplicated, if you like, but I'll give you this right now because um, this YouTube channel is really about uh, decomplicating stuff that shouldn't really be that complicated. Uh, if you like what you've seen so far, make sure you uh, comment um, and also hit that bell icon, uh, hit, hit the um, uh, 
like, subscribe, comment, bell, and you'll get notified as soon as we upload. What was I saying? Capital allowances, that's what I was on about. Now this is a commercial building. So inside uh, the, this commercial building, um, you had things like suspended ceiling, you had air conditioning units, you had all the stuff that, um, fire alarms and stuff like that, that that you would get in a commercial building. Now, with commercial buildings, what you can claim is capital allowances. And sometimes in buildings like this, you may find that there may be 70 or 80,000 pounds worth of embedded capital allowances built into that building, which you can claim. So one of the things that we often do when we pick up commercial buildings, as part of the negotiation um, with the seller, um, we get them to kind of transfer to us the benefit of their capital allowances. Now, obviously, all I'm giving you here is the idea. What you then need to speak to is a specialist capital allowances uh, tax consultant who can help you formalize that into a claim. Um, now, what happens with commercial buildings when you make a capital allowances claim uh, and you negotiate that, they, that those capital allowances are transferred to you on the purchase, it effectively means that the buying costs come down a little bit. Uh, so what might be a £500,000 property can end up being a £420,000 property because you reclaim, you make a claim for uh, the capital allowances that are embedded into the building. Today, I actually, being possibly the, the most current HMO micro studio yes, person the in the room. I wouldn't say the expert, I, but okay. I, would say, <laughs> I would say you certainly are in the market at the current time. Yeah, thanks, John. Appreciate that. The HMO model is risky on this. I don't, I don't actually see it as an HMO model at all. I see, I see the, John, the, the John route, which is get a good extension, get three or four semis on the site, make sure the GDV on those stacks up, it's done to a good spec, um, and you can make some money selling those on. You know, be cautious, this is a word to uh, you know, aspiring investors out there. Don't try and turn everything into an HMO. They don't all work. You know, it's, it's hot property at the moment, um, not That's everything's right. suitable. Don't try and turn everything possible into an HMO just because it, it makes a load of cash flow and, and it looks good on paper. Um, potentially, this one is, is too risky for that. So for that reason, I'm out. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully that advice um, might help you going forward looking for better sites for HMO conversion. And not just don't turn anything, everything into an HMO. I think when you come to pitch uh, on the show, you've got to think about... Um, uh, what's in it, if you like, for uh, us angels to put in our money. And generally speaking, um, what we're looking for is, is some form of exit. Now, the thing with HMOs is it's a long-term hold strategy. And uh, many of the people that you're pitching for, pitching to, uh, want to know, well, where is their exit from the deal? The best exits come from sales, which is why so many of the angels try to kind of push the idea of some kind of, okay, let's get in, uh, let's make some four flats. What are the GDVs on those four flats? Um, will we be able to sell them, realize a profit, uh, exit the deal, it's nice and clean. So well, that's where all that is coming from. My conversion. I would love to back you. Um, come back with another project and I'll back you. I think that one of the biggest things I see with people that do HMOs is... By the way, the reason I said that is because one of the things about, um, this and investing in property projects is that you're not investing in property projects, you're investing in people. And the person, the entrepreneur is just as important, if not more important than the deal itself. So in this, what I was trying to do is basically unpick the entrepreneur from the deal. Uh, I didn't think much of the deal, quite frankly, but the entrepreneur is, um, is, is very, very investable and very backable. Yeah, I did it to start with, to build up the cash flow. It's when to start doing other things, uh, to, to get out of the HMO mindset and see other possibilities in property. And I think you're at that stage where you need to sort of broaden your horizons. Commercial to resi is fantastic. I just don't think there's an, as John said, it's too good. It's not distressed enough. And also this thing that I say about look for two floors and a roof. By the way, I, um, I won't comment on the two floors, I've done that, but what, uh, the whole point of it being too good, now that might seem um, a bit of a woolly description. What we're basically saying, I mean, let's just boil that down. What, um, what, what, what does John and I mean when we're saying this property looks too good, it's not distressed enough? Well, what we're basically saying is the price per square foot, when you look at that property 
and you look at the price they want for it and you look at the square footage of space that you're getting, the price per square foot is pretty similar to residential price per square foot. In other words, there isn't enough of a differential. You know, remember, you've got to buy property at a certain price per square foot. You've got to spend a certain amount per square foot um, making it into what you want it to be. And then there's got to be a profit because the, what you've made it into is worth more. In this case, uh, the base product is too good, which means basically the price per square foot is too high. Um, and therefore the cost of doing um, a sort of conversion scheme isn't worth it. Now, the reason I think why Dylan has favored the HMO route is one, he's got a lot of experience in that area as uh, has borne out by his kind of pitch, if you like. But the other thing is that when people look at HMOs, um, HMOs is a, is a great way of um, making a deal a deal uh, when otherwise it wouldn't be. Because when you look at the renting room by room, you obviously generate more cash flow. And then people think about commercial valuations based on those um, that higher cash flow, and they value that property on that basis. But when you do, when you think about valuing it based on a non-HMO strategy, you suddenly don't get those end values, and then the deal doesn't look as viable. Um, so I think what all the angels are basically saying is yes, um, if he was to get planning permission for this mega HMO, um, it probably could make sense, but that's the only way it would make sense. And whether you get planning for that is very, very iffy indeed. As for, for doing some of the more normal strategies where you get a quick exit, um, the, the, the figures don't stack up because the base cost is too high. Then you can do so much. The thing about planning permission, I don't like dealing with planners, it's too much of a pain. If this was two floors and a roof. That sounded really grumpy of me. Um, there's so much PD available, um, why bother with planning? All we've heard uh, pretty much on this pitch has been about, we could get planning for this, we could get planning for that. Um, it is very uncertain. Um, it, and it is open to uh, local politics and local policies and all the rest of it. And typically it can take eight weeks, but it can also take two or three years. Um, conversion to residential conversion projects benefit from permitted development, which allow you to bypass that whole process. The problem with this building though, is that um, the this is D1, uh, which now fits into the new E-class and we don't know what the um, uh, 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 permitted development conversion rights will be for this type of property. But they will be coming, they'll be coming very soon. And there's so many of these former doctors and dentist surgeries up and down the land, which look very, they were originally residential dwellings and they can be easily be converted to multiple flats. And uh, that opportunity will be fantastic going into 2021. So, but this is just too nice a property to start with and there's not enough space to do the kind of sexy things that you can do with these sort of units. So find one that has a little bit more meat on the bone and come back. First off, HMOs aren't really my bag anyway, um, but I agree that they are forced sometimes and I think this as a deal itself seems a little bit forced based on what the other, the other guys have said predominantly. Um, so it's not really for me based upon that, but great story and I think you're very investable. So another deal it probably would be for me. You yourself, your story is very compelling. I think you clearly know your area and you clearly have um, expertise in the HMO space. And it does sound also to me that you're ready to take that next step. I do echo that maybe this isn't exactly enough meat on the bones, not quite the right opportunity, um, but do come back again with some, something else. And yeah, no, very interesting to, to understand your, your mindset and how you look at these things. Thank you. To sum it up, it needs to be 400 grand. And if it's 400,000, you can flog it on for 500 and not do anything. But thank you very much for coming to see us. And, and, and we'll be in, there'll be another series and we'd be love to see you again. By the way, John, John's absolutely correct. If we're all saying it's not worth 500, then everyone else is going to say that as well. So keep an eye on that vendor. Wait another two or three months and keep going back to them and saying, is it still for sale? Because no one else is going to buy it at that level. It's a very good point. You know, it's a very good tip. Uh, for all of you guys, really, if properties linger on the market, then the market is telling the vendor something. And what you've got to do is go back to the vendor. Because um, a lot of people, when they make an offer on a property, then they come up with a round number, but there's no basis for it. Um, 
what I believe when I make my offers is I justify the offer. I, I, I present the offer and give my reasons why we've come to that price. Think of it this way. If you want to sell your car with one of these sites, like, you know, we buy any car or whatever, you go and sell your car. And um, what they will do is they will, they will offer you a price and it won't particularly be uh, market value type of price. But what they will do is they will justify why they're making you that offer. Oh, you got a little scratch on the bonnet that will need fixing. Oh, it's going to need four sets of tires. Oh, the, um, this needs replacing, that needs replacing. They will come up with a whole bunch of reasons which justify the offer that they're making. And I think that's very, very important. Uh, when you're making a, a pitch to purchase a property from a vendor and it hasn't sold, uh, you need to make your offer and you need to give some justification to that offer which justifies why you want to pay the price you're paying. So in this particular case, once he's done his figures, um, if it's still around, which I think it is, um, you need to go back to the vendor uh, offering the price that you feel it's worth rather than trying to take what the vendor is willing to accept and try to make that into a deal from that point. So let me know what you think of that deal. Would you have done it? Do you think there was more angles there that we didn't cover? Let us know in the comments below. Remember, we release a new one of these pitch videos every single week from the Property Elevator series. Uh, make sure you catch some of the others in the series. The links are in the description below. Dylan, tell us how it went. It went well, got some good feedback, but unfortunately didn't get uh, an investment. Any feedback from the angels? Yeah, just got to get the price a bit lower. Okay. Yeah, so hopefully if I can renegotiate it, leave it a few months. Hopefully we can do something with it. Great, so you're gonna head back today and reassess your numbers? Absolutely.